So now, Kirchhoff rules, finally. Right. It's still chapter 28. Uh, let's dive one more time into uh, a battery. You remember we discussed, we spent like 5-10 minutes uh, discussing batteries. Uh, <clears throat> and now we need to dive a little bit deeper uh, to uh, change the way we model the battery. And see maybe something something is missing right so and we will have to uh somehow change uh the way we model uh, the work of the battery and we need that we need this step uh before uh, we start introducing actually kirchhoff rules right okay so <clears throat> um so let's assume okay not assume uh let's look at a basically gravitational analog of a battery in order basically to understand what is still missing in our in the in the way we model the work of the battery of a battery right so let's look at uh this situation let's say we have two slopes right so you see the slope uh number one and then uh slope number two and there is a there is an opening over here right and let's just drop uh, a few uh, balls okay i'm a soccer fan so of course i usually use uh, soccer balls everywhere right all right and uh, <clears throat> so if i drop um i don't know like in this case uh, six uh, balls right so uh, there will be current of these balls maybe for two or three seconds right if just a few seconds and after a few seconds of course this current of balls will disappear in order to have sort of a continuous flow of these uh, balls, right? So we need to uh, position some kind of pump over here, some kind of device uh, which will just, uh, which would just grab the ball at the bottom and move it to the top, right? And in that case, of course, we will uh, create like a more or less steady uh, current of these bulbs, of these balls, not bulbs, <laughs> from the previous question still. Right. And I couldn't think of anything better than a guy with uh, Brazilian colors, right? Because Brazilians, they are really crazy about football, about soccer, right? <clears throat> so I couldn't resist to put this guy over here. So let's say uh, he will be just grabbing the ball at the bottom, right? And move uh, it uh, to the top, right? So now he will be able to uh, keep uh, this current flowing. But if this car, if number of balls over here in this uh, in our circuit is reasonably small, yeah, most likely he will be able to keep up, right? So he uh, would be f he is fast enough uh, to grab the ball, move it up, right? But if I increase number of balls in this circuit, uh, he wouldn't be able to keep up. At some point, he will start uh, creating some natural hindrance to otherwise a completely free flow of balls, right? So uh he would yeah at some point he would start screaming something like this give me a break right i do it as fast as i can so pretty much there will be some a bottleneck effect at the bottom over here created right some natural resistance appear to otherwise a completely free flow of balls because of the by because of his nature because of uh because he's still a human right and it takes some time to move to grab the ball and move it up right so you see uh, the presence of this pump, presence of this guy in this particular case, right? Creates a natural, some additional resistance to the current, right? And exactly the same happens in the battery. Because we, you remember we have two electrodes and you remember it takes some time uh, for electrons to be moved from one electrode to the other one. Right, you remember we discussed that ion of zinc traveling right, uh, and leaving uh, two electrons behind on one electrode and getting two electrons from the other electro electrode, right? So it takes some time, it doesn't, it doesn't happen inst instantaneously. So you see in the battery uh, exactly the same thing happens. So that, uh, that ion of zinc cannot move electrons instantaneously, it takes time. So it, uh, it can also scream, give me, a, give me a break, I do it as fast as I can. Right? So now you see, we have some effect which we haven't uh, introduced in our model, uh, in, in the way we model the battery, right? So we need to include some additional parameter uh, which would be able to describe that. And of course, this process, 
is quite complicated, right? You remember we discussed that and if you try to uh, get into all the details of this process, it, it will be ridiculously complicated. So what do we, uh, what do uh, physicists uh, usually do in these cases? It's called kind of sweeping all these uh, troubles under the rug. They just introduced uh, what is called the internal resistance. And that internal resistance is measured experimentally. So pretty much all those complicated uh, mechanism which happens inside, it's all inside, inside of this parameter. And we measure it experimentally. So as a result, in this, in this case, we don't have to answer all those complicated questions, what actually happens inside of the battery, right? At least at this point. Of course, you, if you want to optimize the battery, if you want to make it work better and better and better, of course, you will have to dive deeper and actually model everything, right? And describe everything properly. But at this level, we can just introduce the internal resistance and that's it. And it, we will measure it experimentally. And again, this internal resistance basically describes this, this effect that the pump, which moves electrons, or in this case, balls, is not fast enough. And as a result, uh, there is a naturally uh, bottleneck effect is created, right? Okay, so now, as a result, a uh, battery uh, can be uh, sort of modeled uh, as... Um, can, uh, now we can say that the battery consists of two, basically, sort of like a two parts, two elements, right? So the first one, uh, it's uh, that part which produces actually the potential difference. That's the ideal battery, right? And uh, the uh, potential difference across an ideal battery, we're going to call the EMF of the battery. And we're going to use the capital uh, Epsilon, Greek letter Epsilon, the capital one. And the second part of the battery is this internal resistance. Right? Of course, they belong to the same battery, they are inseparable, right? They are inseparable. But when we draw the circuit, sometimes internal resistance can be drawn uh, separately, right? But of course, this internal resistance is a natural part of the whole battery. Then, this EMF, uh, EMF stands electromotive force. Sounds really fancy, really cool, right? Uh, but don't... Uh, try to find any meaning in these words, electromotive force. Don't try to find any meaning, because there are no any meaning. There, there is no any meaning. The thing is, uh, back then, or 200, 250 years ago, uh, when all this uh, was a hot subject uh, in physics, right? Of course, they tried to model somehow, imagine what, uh, what uh, happened in the battery. And they, based on that model, they came up with this term electromotive force, right? Of course, all, the, uh, all that model happens to be completely, complete junk, right? Not correct, let's put it this way, not correct, right? Of course, that model was uh, dumped, but the term survived, maybe because it sounds cool, right? It's my guess because it sounds so cool, so fancy, electromotive force, so the term has survived. But of course, uh, don't try to find any meaning in, this, uh, in these words, electromotive force. It's just basically potential difference across an ideal battery when resistance, internal resistance is uh, shown separately. All right. So from now on, we're going to use this uh, term EMF quite often. Right. All right. Then, um, since... Okay, we, you do homework using mastering physics, so be careful uh, the, and use the correct symbol. In order to find this EMF, again, you need to go to the Greek uh, alphabet box, right? Alpha, beta, gamma, and so on, right? And go all the way to the end of that uh, Greek alphabet box. And at the very end, there is a capital EMF, capital Epsilon. And if you put a cursor above that symbol, it, it will show you EMF, right? So use that symbol uh, in, your, uh, in your answers. If, of course, EMF is needed in your answer. Because, yeah, it's a typical place for mistakes, right? Uh, okay, not mistakes, just uh, the mastering physics, of course, uh, doesn't accept the student's answer. And, of course, students start sending me emails, right? So how, how come? Because they usually use a uh, small EMF. Okay.
so now right uh so as i said uh natural i mean internal resistance is the part of uh, a battery so if you uh, measure the potential difference across the battery let's say battery is connected to some load and usually we measure the potential difference across um, a battery so what do we measure we measure this we measure the uh, potential electric potential increase because of this emf and then of course there will be voltage drop across the internal resistance right so you will see emf you see emf minus i times r that's what you measure okay so this is the one electrode of the battery this is the second electrode of the battery if you take a voltmeter probes and position them uh to these those electrodes what are you going to measure you're going to measure this emf minus i r and that's uh that's what we call the terminal voltage uh of the battery all right terminal voltage again that is basically when a battery is connected to the load of course current flows uh through the circuit right so this current i right so as a result what you're going to measure is going to be terminal voltage and of course you see it is smaller than emf you see smaller than emf terminal voltage all right all right so then of course natural question so how can we measure then emf sort of practically right experimentally right so how can we measure emf so in order to measure emf because you see every time uh if you try to measure the potential difference across electrodes you measure terminal voltage so experimentally it is usually done like this so remove the load from the battery right basically cut the cord remove the load right uh, as a result uh, this current i will be uh, zero take your voltmeter right and measure the of course potential difference with the voltmeter of course voltmeter draw a little bit of current but that current is very 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 small right so it's designed like that voltmeter so if uh, that current is small so this i is very very small and the terminal voltage will be very very close to the uh, emf of the battery but, but but of course in this case a battery must be disconnected from the load right so take the battery of uh, of a device out of the device whatever device you use right and you measure and if you measure yeah uh potential difference across the electrodes that terminal voltage is going to be very close to the emf right? but if you try to measure the potential difference across uh electrodes of the battery when the battery is inside of the device you're going to measure your potential terminal voltage is going to be uh smaller than emf because again uh through the battery there is a current i there will be a voltage drop across the internal resistance and you're going to see uh, the <coughs> voltage which is smaller than EMF. It can be significantly smaller, right? <coughs> okay, not that, but like, for example, I don't remember which device I used. I remember a nine volt battery, but when it was connected to, uh, to the device, and I remember I measured it, it was like 8.7, uh, 8.8 uh, volts instead of nine volts. So that 0.2 volts voltage drop came from this uh, uh, term I times R. Okay, so now we know what, what uh, EMF is, and now we are ready to uh, move to Kirchhoff rules. Okay, so uh, introduction. Um, so we saw when we uh, introduced the method of an equivalent resistance that uh, that method can be used only when resistors connected either in series or in parallel. Then or only then um, we can use that method. But of course you all know that there are tons of situations when resistors are not connected in that way. They're not connected uh, either in series or in parallel, right? So as a result, of course, the method of an equivalent resistance cannot be used. Then what can be used if uh, that method is, uh, is illegal to apply? And Kirchhoff rules can be used. There are no limitations on the situations where Kirchhoff rules uh, can be used. And you will see why 
in the second when we start introducing uh, these rules and I will tell you what actually lies what actually lies behind these rules and uh, you know what um, you know what probably I will tell you immediately uh, if you compare this title with titles in the book right I usually use uh, the words Kirchhoff rules uh, book uses Kirchhoff laws I'm sort of not that it's not a big deal but for me law again it's something fundamental something universal which can be applied at any point of the universe at any moment of time by anyone no limitations whatsoever right and those as I said it's Gauss's law Coulomb's law Newton's laws and so on and so forth right this in my opinion these are rules Kirchhoff rules because what he did he just grabbed universal laws like for example conservation of charge and applied it to in a circuitry so basically he applied universal law for a particular uh, case in a circuitry and for me it's sort of it's a, I would call it a Kirchhoff rules instead of Kirchhoff laws Less law again it's a yeah conservation of charge it's a fundamental law but once you apply it to some particular situation yeah I would prefer to call it uh, a rule but again it's not a big deal then the second uh, he apply also conservation of energy in a circuit yes so he apply fundamental law universal law in a particular example so for for me it's sort of like I should be called rules, coach of rules. Okay, but it's not a big deal. But I just wanted to tell you that uh, what lies behind these uh, rules, um, it's a conservation of charge and conservation of energy. Two universal laws. Then, uh, again, um, no limitations where uh, you can apply these rules. And again, uh, we apply them to do what? To analyze circuits what does it mean analyzing circuits you just need to find potential differences across each element in the circuit and current flowing through each element of the circuit again once you know that you know everything about that circuit particular circuit ah and another thing uh, actually Kirchhoff uh, managed to write these rules when he was still a graduate student and it's this is one of the one of his biggest achievement in his life right so the biggest achievement he managed to achieve uh, while, while he was a still a, while, while he was a, a still a graduate student. Right? Okay, so now finally, uh, let's introduce rules. The first rule you already used it. Uh, we already used it, right? Uh, several times, so it's not it's not new. So if you have a junction point, you see junction point where uh, wires are you know, soldered, and then total amount of current entering junction point must be equal to the total amount of current leaving that junction point that's what we have here total amount of current in equals to the total amount of current out again we use this uh, law already several times and again what lies behind of this it's a conservation of charge if 10 electrons per unit uh, per second enter that junction point it must be equal to 10 electrons leaving the junction point. It's just basically a conservation of charge, right? Um, so that's what we're going to use, right? And uh, usually students don't have any troubles applying this uh, rule. Uh, yeah, sometimes on the exam, they just forget to apply that rule. They apply the second rule, but this sometimes students forget just to apply. But once they, once they apply it, usually no troubles. Um, everything usually is correct. Okay, so that is the rule number one. It's called John Kirchhoff's junction rule. Now the second rule, the loop rule. Uh, application of this is slightly more complicated, right? So, but anyway, so what does it say? So if you have uh, any loop, you can pick any, virtually any loop in the circuit, right? Then if you pick sort of like a, a, a travel direction, direction along which you're going to uh, sort of complete the loop then if you pick for example this is the starting point so if you start from this point and walk this way counting all potential differences potential differences adding potential differences across each of these elements 
when you get back to the same point, to the starting point, you must end up with zero. That's what we have here. Sum of all potential differences across all of these elements. When you add them up, you must get zero. In our case, right, so let's say we have delta V1, delta V2, potential difference across the third, and potential difference across the fourth one. If you add up all these potential differences, you must end up with zero at the end. That's what uh, loop rule, Kirchhoff's loop rule tells us. Okay, again, as I said, natural question, what lies behind this loop rule? And I already mentioned, and I already told you like a few minutes ago, it's a conservation of energy. Let me show you that uh, this is actually correct. Let's just um, keep track of one electron. So electrons start here and completes this loop. And I want to uh, keep track of its uh, total energy, right? Which is, of course, going to consist of two parts, kinetic energy and potential energy, right? And, of course, I can write, uh, I can write uh, conservation of mechanical energy. And I'm going to write that uh, law in this, uh, in this form, delta K, change in the kinetic energy, equals to the negative change in the potential energy. It's basically the same like uh, conservation of energy uh, the, way, uh, the way I applied. You remember I usually wrote some, write something like this. K initial plus U initial equals K final plus U final. But if you rearrange the terms, move all kinetic energies to one side of the equation and all potential energies to the other side of the equation, you will end up with this, what is written over here. Delta K, it's a K final minus K initial equals to minus delta U. It's a minus U final minus U initial. So basically what is written here and what I usually write, it's the same. All right. Okay, so then we're going to assume that current is steady. It means that uh, this electron, when it drifts uh, through this circuit, it drifts with exactly the same uh, average speed, right? Average speed. So it means that if at the very beginning it had like, I don't know, let's say five meters per second speed, it will, be ex it will have exactly the same five meters per second speed at the very end. So it means that what will be the value of delta K? It will be zero because kinetic energy, when the electron started from this point and when after completing this loop, electrons come, electron comes back to the same starting point, of course, its kinetic energy will be still the same. So delta K is zero. So as a result, we'll be, we can write, so delta U change in the potential energy is zero, right? So that's what I have here. And then we know that Potential energy, electric potential energy is connected to the electric potential through this formula, U equals QV, where Q charge of the electron, right? So, of course, we can write this as uh, Q times delta V equals zero. Charge of an electron is constant, so that can be uh, dropped, right? And as a result, we have, uh, and of course, this delta V equals to zero. And this delta V is across the whole loop because we follow the electron when it completes the loop. So inside of this delta V, it's the all potential differences. There are all potential differences inside of the loop. So that's what we have here. Delta V of the loop equals to sum of all potential differences equals to zero. So basically of what Kirchhoff, uh, what lies behind this Kirchhoff loop rule, it's a conservation of energy, right? So he applied, yes, fundamental laws for uh, particular examples, right? Okay, so, uh, great, so we introduced uh, both rules and now we need to start applying them. But you know what, there are no any troubles to start applying um, junction rule. But if you start applying loop rule, um, we need to look carefully how we can calculate all these delta Vs. Because we have different elements. And we need to develop mnemonic rules which can be used to write down these contributions. Okay, let me write. So, uh, to write down these delta Vs. All right. Uh, and we're going to write uh, four rules which we're going to use all the time. Uh, two rules we're going to use uh, to calculate uh, contributions to these equations. 
uh, created by batteries. Okay, after the break we will continue, but let me finish this sentence, right? Uh, two rules which we will use uh, to describe contributions uh, from the batteries and two rules uh, uh, to describe contributions to this equation from the resistor, right? Um, yeah, I will uh, then uh, the rest I will tell when we uh, when we introduce this rule. So again, basically now we need to prepare ourselves uh, to write down this uh, loop uh, rule equations uh, in the most efficient way. Otherwise, it can be tedious, uh, painful. So once you develop these rules, uh, then it's much much easier, uh, faster to write these equations. So let's start with battery. So potential, basically what we want to get for this loop rule, potential differences, delta V, right? So let's assume that uh, this is the battery in the circuit, right? And uh, as I told you when I introduced the loop rule, so every time we will have to pick what is called a travel direction because we need to move uh, all the time in a certain direction. It doesn't matter which direction. We have two directions, either clockwise or counterclockwise, basically. But again, which direction you pick, it doesn't really matter. But you need to pick a direction and stay with that direction. So basically, you need to cross each of those elements in that direction. You cannot move back and forth. This element I cross this way, but the next element I crossed in the opposite direction. No. You need to pick a certain direction and cross all of those elements in exactly following the same direction. Again, which direction? It doesn't matter, but you need to pick one and stick with that. So let's assume that this is the battery and let's assume that you pick the direction this. This is your travel direction, right? So now, once you see the travel direction, which point is final and which point is initial? Now it's obvious, right? So uh, here you are later, so that is the final point, right? And uh, that will be the initial point. And again, what we need to calculate, we need to calculate delta V, which is V final, again, by, uh, by the rules of calculus, right? Delta V by definition, it's a V final minus V initial. So that's what we need to find, right? And now, once you pick a travel direction, you know which point is final and which point is initial. In this case, this is, as I said, it's a final point. And that will be this, wait, this, uh, will be our initial point, right? So pretty much, now you see, what's the logic? Why do we need this travel direction? So that we will know which point is final and which point is initial. Without picking a travel direction, we wouldn't be able to tell which point is final, which point is initial. So the logic behind the travel, travel direction, so that we can say which point is final and which point is initial. Right. So that's the logic. Okay, so now <clears throat> we know which point final, which point is initial. Now we need to understand which point is at higher potential and which point is at lower potential. And in this case, uh, the answer is obvious because we know properties of the battery, right? So this side of the battery, this electrode of the battery on this side, it's a positively charged, that is negatively charged, right? So of course, the final point, this point is at higher potential, right? So that is a point, uh, at this point is at higher potential, our final point. And initial point, this point, right, initial point, this is at lower potential, right? Because that is the negative electrode of the battery. So, of course, we can uh, tell that information uh, based on the properties of the battery. And of course, uh, final and initial point uh, based on the information about the uh, travel direction. Right. So now we have almost everything uh, to come up uh, to the right conclusion, right? And we also assume that this is an ideal battery. So if it has an internal resistance, it can be drawn separately in the circuit and treated, and we can treat that internal resistor as just a regular resistor. And the rules we will introduce uh, on the next slide. Right, so this is an ideal battery. So potential difference across an ideal battery, you remember, is 
EMF, that uh, term which we just introduced, right? And that's why I uh, positioned that slide before Kirchhoff rules, because we needed to introduce uh, EMF. Okay, so now V final minus V initial, and we just discussed so that V final, final point is at higher electric potential that init than initial point. So, of course, I can write it as V plus minus V minus. Again, V plus, it means higher potential. V minus, it means lower electric potential. So if you subtract a uh, smaller number from larger number, of course, the uh, potential difference is going to be positive, right? And we know the, um, uh, the, expression, the, the, uh, the value of that electric uh, potential difference. It's EMF, right? It's the EMF of the battery, EMF of the battery, because yeah, usually when you position the battery into the circuit, you know it's, uh, it's EMF. So, but anyway, we just wanted to get the sign. In this case, contribution to that e loop equation from, uh, from this battery, so delta V equals to plus EMF. Yeah, here. Delta V in this case uh, will be plus EMF. So that's what we're going to write um, uh, for the loop equation or contribute to the loop equation. So that's the contribution to the loop equation from the battery like this and you travel from minus to plus so now uh mnemonic rule number one <coughs> which we're going to use if you travel across the battery from minus to plus contribution to the loop equation is plus emf it's a rule number one now uh rule number two basically now what if we uh travel uh, from plus to minus and of course, at this point, probably you should be able to guess what will, what will be the contribution. So now rule number two, anyway. So again, the battery, but now you see, I flipped polarity. Over here, I had minus and plus over there. Now I have plus on this side and minus on that side. And I will keep the travel direction also still uh, that way. But now you see, we travel from plus to minus. Here, we travel from minus to plus. Now from plus to minus. So now what will be the contribution to the loop equation uh, from this battery? You should be able to guess easily. But anyway, let's, let's first, uh, again, this is the final point because, because we travel that way. So this point is initial point, right? And uh, again, uh, higher and lower electric potential, we can easily tell. So now initial point, this initial point, right? Is, it's a, a positive electrode. Of course, this point is at higher potential, right? And the final point is at lower potential. So now V final minus V initial, again, final point, this point is at lower potential. So that's V minus and initial point is at higher potential. So that's V plus. So I can write it over here, V minus minus V plus. So we're subtracting larger number, larger number from smaller number. Of course, as a result, contribution is going to be negative. And of course, we know the absolute value of that contribution again, because it's still the battery and the EMF is usually given. But now the contribution is going to be negative minus EMF. <coughs> so rule number two, mnemonic rule number two, if you travel across the battery from plus to minus, contribution is minus EMF. So that's how we treat, we're going to treat the battery uh, applying a uh, loop rule, right? So now uh, let's uh, discuss resistors. Uh, situation with resistors slightly more complicated, <coughs> but slightly. And you will see in a second why. So, but anyway, two rules related to the battery, to a battery. Now, two rules about resistors, how we should treat resistors. So now potential differences across resistors. So let's pick a resistor, any resistor. Usually resistance is given. We will look at the examples, right? And uh, now, as I said again, first of all, before you start applying loop, uh, loop rule, you need to pick a travel direction. Let's assume that you pick a certain, let's assume it's that way. 
So that's our travel direction. Again, once you know the travel direction, you can, you can tell which point is initial and which point is final. So that is uh, our uh, initial point. And of course, this will be our final point according to chosen travel direction. Again, you can pick any travel direction, but you need to pick one. Now, at this point, when we discuss the batteries, we could tell which point is at higher potential and which point was at um, lower potential because we knew properties of the batteries, right? So that was the positive electrode, that was the negative electrode. But now, in this case, can you tell me which point is at higher potential and which point is at lower electric potential? I doubt. Because right now, we just don't have any information about the electric potential. It's just pretty, pretty much impossible to tell. It's not there, it's not on the picture. So right now, uh, it sounds like we are at the dead end without uh, being able to move any further because that information is just missing completely. But we can use the trick, which we already used uh, a few times. And I told you that we're going to use it even more, right? Uh, you remember, we had uh, all the time, a current can flow uh, either this way or that way. Right? We have 50% of chances getting it right, right? So we're going to use the trick, assuming a current direction. You remember I used it already. Let's use the trick here one more time. Let's assume a current direction. And you will see in a second why we need this. So let's assume a current direction. Again, uh, we're going to assume it means that it's not the... Because very often, uh, getting the correct direction is next to impossible. It's very complicated. But we can assume a direction, a certain direction, write all the equations with that assumption, and at the end, of course, we will have to calculate a current, because that's what we usually most of the time want to find analyzing the circuits, right? So if you calculate that current, and if your answer at the end happens to be positive, great! It means that uh, your uh, assumption about current direction was correct, right? You're the lucky one, right? Go buy yourself a lottery, right? It's your lucky day, right? But if your current at the end happens to be negative, big deal. So you basically can tell immediately what's the absolute value of the current and minus what just indicates that your original assumption about the current direction was just wrong. But it, it means if this direction is wrong, it means that that direction is the correct one. So anyway, in both cases, you can you solve the problem, right? So assuming current direction is not a crime in these cases, right? In both cases, if, you, if you're guessing is right or wrong, you, you can solve the problem. So let's use that trick, that uh, high chances of guessing it, right? Because 50% of uh, chances of... Um, Guessing the correct direction is a huge, uh, is uh, the huge percentage. Right. So let's assume a current direction. Now you see we have two directions: travel direction and current direction. So let's assume that uh, that is the our current direction. And now, once we assumed a current direction, can you tell me which point is at higher potential and which point is at the initial potential? And we already, we had, I think, in the previous lecture, we had, a we had a conceptual question about this, right? You remember we had the resistor, part of the circuit, and direction of the current was given. And I ask you, which point A or B uh, was at the higher electric potential? It's basically this. And that question was basically preparing us for this situation. So now, once you know the direction of current, and you remember current flows from plus to minus, our convention. And again, in that question, we realize that current all the time flows from the region with higher electric potential to the regions with lower electric potential. So once we assumed current direction in this case, we can tell that here we have higher potential, over there we have lower potential because current flows from plus to minus. So once we introduced current direction, now we can sort of 
you know, crush this dead end and we can start moving forward again. So now we can say that uh, this point is at higher V according to this assumption. And this point is going to be at the lower electric potential. Now, you see, in order to analyze resistors, we need to uh, have two directions, current direction and travel direction. For better, you will only need it a, a travel direction, right? Okay, so now uh, we should be able to write the contribution. Okay, so plus minus, right? So all that. Now we should be able to write a potential difference, contribution to the loop equation for this situation. So delta V, again, by definition, it's a V final minus V initial, right? Initial point we see, final point we also see, right? So our final point is, so you see, this is our final point is at lower potential. So this will be V final is V minus and initial point is at higher potential. So our initial point, this will be V plus. So it will be V minus minus V plus. So what will be the contribution to the, uh, is contribution going to be positive or negative? Of course negative, because you're subtracting larger number from the smaller number. And what's the expression for the contribution? Now, Usually, resistance is given in the, in the circuit. We will see examples, right? And what do we need to find most of the time? Currents. So, how can we write this delta V? Using Ohm's law. I times R. But of course, negative. So, that will be the contribution to the loop equation uh, in this case. So, minus I R. Again, R usually is given. I we need to, we need to find. So now as a result, we can write uh, mnemonic rule number three, which is related to a uh, resistor, to a resistor. If your current direction and travel directions are the same, contribution must be negative, minus I R. Right? So if directions are the same, contribution is negative, minus I R. Now, the last, uh, the last rule number four, and now you should be able to guess it uh, basically even without uh, discussions, right? So, of course, in the last rule, uh, these directions are going to be opposite, right? And, of course, you should be able to guess what will be the contribution. Contribution will be positive plus IR. But anyway, let's discuss it quickly now, uh, faster. Again, the resistor, let's assume. Uh, let's assume that uh, travel direction that way. Again, you pick. And let's assume that now a uh, current direction is opposite. You pick current direction that way. Uh, again, current direction, don't sweat. Don't try to guess, think, right? No, just pick any direction. Again, in, in either case, uh, you, will solve, you will be able to solve the problem. So don't sweat about these directions. Don't try to get, predict something. Uh, to Just pick any direction. Stay with that direction, solve the problem at the end. You can adjust it if it's needed, <coughs> right? So for now, let's assume that these directions are opposite to each other. So of course, uh, that is our uh, final point. That is our initial point. Uh, of course, current flows pl from plus to minus. So this, points is, this point is at higher potential. That point is at lower potential, right? So as a result, we can write V final minus V initial. So this is final point now is at higher potential. So that is V plus. And this point, initial point is at lower potential. So V plus minus V minus contribution is positive plus I times R. So mnemonic rule number four, the last one. If travel direction and current directions are opposite, contribution positive plus I R. Okay. Do we have to remember these rules? You can say, for example, you know what? I, your rules are stupid. I hate your rules, right? I hate everything about these rules, right? Okay, no big deal. Analyze each situation using this uh, logic. You know what? After a couple of examples, let's say you have two circuits, right? Uh, for, let's, for example, you have a couple of examples where you have a multi-loop circuit, right? And once you start analyzing each element like this, you will start hating those problems. It's so 
yeah, it's kind of uh, straightforward, but so tedious, boring, right? Keeping track of all these directions, where, which point high, initial, which point final, where potential higher, where potential lower. It will drive you crazy. Really, right? It's so tedious, right? So, you sooner or later, maybe after two, three examples, you will start naturally developing your own rules, some mnemonic rules. They will be, they might be slightly different than this, but they will be somewhat close to this. Idea will be somewhat similar, right? So sooner or later, you will come up with maybe your own rules, but they will be slightly different. So it's just naturally because otherwise it's a, it's a painful to, to analyze each element like this. And each circuit can have, I don't know, 10, 15 elements and analyzing each of these elements uh, in this way, it's, it's, it's really painful. So, sooner or later, you will develop your own rules. In this case, we develop these rules. Okay, in physics, right? Okay, so now, uh, after this, uh, let's start looking at examples. Right. Yeah, examples. So, let me switch to the whiteboard and... Uh, Look at a couple of examples. And usually I give a question like this on the exam because, yeah, it's important, right? Kirchhoff rules, again, as I said, uh, they don't have limitations. You can apply them to any uh, circuit. It's not like a method of an equivalent capacitance or resistance. They, they are limited. Applicability of, uh, applicability of those uh, rules are limited. But in this case, no limitations. Okay, so, uh, what do we have here? It's an example. You see, we have, ah, uh, you know what? Oh yeah, it doesn't matter. Let's start with this immediately. First, I thought about uh, one loop uh, circuit, but it's not a big deal. Uh, we have, uh, you see, two loop circuit. Uh, two batteries, EMF1, again, you, you remember, it's basically a potential difference of an ideal battery. EMF2, second battery, and we have three resistors, R1, R2, and R3. All these are given. I don't know, 5 volts, 3 volts, I don't know, 1 ohm, 2 ohm, 3 ohm, so all these numbers are given. So we need to analyze it. So what does it mean analyzing it? We need to know uh, potential differences across each of these resistors and currents through each of these resistors. Pretty much we know everything about, about the battery, so we, nothing, uh, nothing is unknown. But about resistors, yeah, three parameters R, I, delta V, resistances are given, but we need to find currents and potential differences, right? So that's the goal. Uh, and before, actually, I start writing the equations, let me discuss this. Uh, we have two approaches, which we, uh, two method, methods which we introduced. Again, method of an equivalent resistance and now Kirchhoff rules. Can we apply the method of an equivalent resistances, uh, resistance in this case? Because again, uh, some, as I told you in the previous class, some students develop this habit. Whenever they see resistors drawn sort of graphically parallel to each other, they immediately jump to the conclusion that those resistors are connected in parallel. Like in this case, you see this resistor R1 and R2. Graphically, it looks like they are parallel to each other. But again, graphical uh, that graphical <laughs> approach doesn't make any sense. We need to look what, you remember? Potential differences. Potential differences across elements must be the same all the time, right? And let's look at the potential differences across R1 and R2. You see, at the bottom, Okay, the points below R1 and this point, right? And even this, right? So they are all at exactly the same potentials, electric potential, because they, all these points belong to this big chunk of metal, because the wire is just a chunk of metal, right? But what about points above these resistors? This point is determined by the electrode of that battery. This point is the potential, ele electric potential of this point is determined by electric potential of this and that. And the electric potential of this point is determined by that, right? So you see, 
uh, points above these points are will be definitely at different electric potentials because this battery is going to change the electric potential between uh, uh, those three points, right? So you see, as a result, delta V1 is not going to be equal to delta V2 and is not going to be equal to delta V3. So these elements are not in parallel, right? According to the physics. Right? So it means that the method of an equivalent resistance cannot be used here. Illegal, right? Okay, so it means that uh, what nothing else left except for Kirchhoff rules. So we need to apply them because they don't have any limitations. You can pick any junction point, any loop, and you can apply those rules. Right. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, before we start writing rules, I mean, yeah, those equations, uh, we need to make a few preliminary steps. Okay, let me write that down. <clears throat> Uh, maybe you know what I will write here. So which way I wrote it? Uh, this. Three preliminary steps. All right. So first one. We need to identify all junction points. Identify junction points. I will just write junction points. But you understand that we need to just uh, identify and label them. In this case, we have two junction points, this and that. Right, so let me label. I think I labeled the upper one A, yeah. So let's call this as junction point A, and this will be my junction point B. I've seen in the past some students confused and they uh, treat, for example, this corner as a junction point. No, that is not a junction point. That point is as good as any point uh, over here, right? So this is just, we bend it in order to complete the loop, to, in order to make loops, right? No, in the junction points, currents get merged or get split, right? In these points, nothing happens with the current. Currents changes only at this point and this point, right? So then, uh, second, Again, you, as I just told you, right, so what happens at junction points, currents uh, either get split or they merge, right? So at junction points, currents change, uh, can ch change their values, right? So current can change here, currents, and there. But between junction points, between junction points, current must stay the same because there are no any junction points. Look, what if I take this part of the circuit from point A, this part of the circuit to point B. We don't have any junction points. It means what? It means that over there current stays the same. Right? No junction points, conservation of current without junction points, current stays the same. So if current stays the same, let's just give it a name. For example, I1. And of course, at the end, we need to find that current. But now we're just introducing the first unknown. And we only know one fact about that unknown, that between point A and point B in this part of the circuit, it stays constant. So let's introduce that uh, current. And uh, which direction? We only know that it is going to stay constant. But what will be a direction of that current? This way, counterclockwise or clockwise, we have no idea. And it's difficult to, to see it immediately, the direction, because basically we have a battle of two batteries. This battery is trying to drive the current everywhere in one direction. This battery is trying to drive the current in the whole circuit somehow in some other direction. So right now, it's uh, next to impossible to see the correct direction of the current. But as we just discussed like a few minutes ago, let's assume a direction. And if at the end, when we calculate current, uh, our current happens to be positive, great, your assumption was correct. You're the lucky one, right? But if your current happens to be negative minus, big deal, you see the absolute value and minus just indicates that your assumption about current direction was wrong. So don't sweat, pick, any direction. This one or this one, I cannot tell, uh, yeah, 
as I said, don't sweat, just pick a direction. Uh, let me choose which uh, one I picked. Okay, I picked this one in my notes. Right, so I pick this direction. So this is my uh, I1. And again, you must remember it between point A and B. And again, nothing wrong if you uh, picked, for example, uh, direction that way. But again, it must be only between points A and B. Right? So basically, we introduced the first unknown, which we need to uh, <clears throat> eventually find. Right? Now, you see, we started making the second step. We need to introduce all the currents and label them. Okay, introduce currents, uh, their direction, and label them. Oh, actually, introduce basically it means labeling. Right, so let, which way I wrote it? And which way, what I wrote? Um, so now, let me introduce currents and directions. And current directions, of course. Right, so that will be our second preliminary step. It's basically, right now, it's like a, in cooking, right? Let's say you're cooking soup, right? So first you, you prepare tons of ingredients, right? And then you start just pouring, the, dumping them one by one at the proper time in the pot, right? Cooking. So now the same. So I'm just uh, preparing ingredients and then uh, writing down the equation. It's sort of like a, uh, when you start cooking it. So uh, the second ingredient, so we need to introduce uh, all the currents. So, and of course, that's not, it's not the whole story. So now uh, this part of the circuit, right, you see between point A and B, again, no junction points. It means that current stays there the same. Again, let's give it a name and choose a direction. Again, we cannot tell is it going to be up or down, but who cares? We'll just pick a certain direction and, that, and, and then at the end we can adjust uh, if it's needed. I pick direction up in my notes, right? Again, nothing wrong if you pick, for example, it uh, down, but I pick one, uh, I mean up. So that's the second current. And of course, there will be this third current, uh, again, between points A and B, but in this part of the circuit. Again, no junction points, so it means current must be the same. So let's just give it a name and pick a completely arbitrary direction. I picked up again, I picked this way. And that will be my uh, I sub three. So three currents, basically that's what we need to find. Just now I introduced uh, unknowns. Okay, let me write also. So now I1, I2, and I3, that's our unknowns. Okay, so two preliminary steps and there's a last one. The last one, uh, which one? Travel directions. You remember, we need to pick also travel directions so, we will, so that uh, we will know which points are final and which points are initial. Right. So travel directions, again, any direction can be, uh, is correct, but you just need to pick one and stay with that direction. Okay, and here uh, there are two loops. I'm going to use two loops. Uh, loop number one, this internal, and loop number two. Of course, if you are sort of careful, you can tell immediately, uh, what about the external loop? This loop, that's correct. But I will tell about that loop uh, when we solve the problem, or actually I can tell you immediately, uh, that external loop is going to give us an equation which, is a, uh, which can be written as a linear superposition of the equation produced by this loop and the equation produced by that loop. So basically, if you add the equation produced by this with the equation produced by that, you will get the equation around the loop number three, that external loop. If you can write as a sum, it basically means that equation is linearly uh, dependent and it means that it's redundant. It doesn't give us any additional information. So over here, uh, only equations produced by uh, two loops are um, important. So we're going to use loop number one and loop number two. External one, we can, we can dump it. Right? But I will say a, a few words about that later. So travel direction for the loop number one, which one I pick? I pick counterclockwise. <clears throat> but again, not a big deal. You can uh, pick clockwise. It's, it is as good as I told you. you can, don't sweat, pick any travel direction and stay with that direction. So let me write it. Uh, travel 
and let me write loop one travel direction and for the second loop I also pick the same direction travel loop number two again if you picked for example in the opposite direction it is as good I just want to follow my notes right so that I can check from time to time if I if to make sure that I don't make some silly mistakes right <clears throat> okay so now this is uh, uh, step number three so uh, travel directions travel uh, directions right okay that's it so three preliminary steps and now we are ready to start cooking to actually write the equations all the equations mm. so let's start first with a junction rule and junction rule according to the junction rule the total amount of current entering junction point must be equal to the total amount of current leaving junction point we have two junction points we identified in a step number one so junction point a and junction point b which way i wrote it okay i just a and circle it right so junction point a okay so let's see which current uh enter in uh i2 enters junction point a and i3 you see enters so on the left hand side we're going to see we're going to have i2 plus i sub 3 equals now on the right hand side out out there is only one current i1 which leaves junction point a so i1 then junction point b b in i1 equals to uh out current i2 and current i3 leaves our junction point b so it is equal to i2 plus i3 what's the difference between these two equations basically there are no any difference they're identical right so it means that uh, there is no point of keeping one of these equations right so it means that we can say that one of these equations is redundant it doesn't give us any additional information right so it means that we can dump one of these equations or i dump i will dump uh, this one so I will write redundant and I will dump it so now actually it's not by accident all the time if you have uh, a multi-loop circuit with n let's say n junction points then there will be only n minus one useful junction equations all the time one equation is going to be redundant and can be dumped so it's not by accident every time one uh, junction uh, rule equation uh, yeah equation uh, one junction rule equation is uh, useless right so it's not by accident <clears throat> okay so now um, okay I'm not going to write what I just told you right so uh, it will be in my notes and of course I'm, I'm sure that you will remember now the next uh, so basically what uh, nothing else uh, from the junction rule only one equation you know what let me ask you this <clears throat> so this is equation number one how many equations do we need overall in order to solve this problem three why look how many unknowns do we have we need to find we need to find i1 i2 i3 so we have three unknowns so from the mathematical point of view in order to solve for three unknowns you must have three equations if you have less you will never be able to solve uh, for unique values unique values of uh, these currents so there must be three equations we have only one so far so it means that two equations must come from uh, the loop rule. Okay, so now let's write the loop rule. Right, uh, which is, okay, sum of all potential differences uh, in the loop must be equal to zero. Okay, and two loops, loop number one, loop number two. 
So let me start with a loop one. Okay, so all ingredients are ready. So now we just need to uh, pick a starting point, right? And of course we will end at the same point. So I will start, for example, from here, from this point. So that will be my, my starting point. Why? It's just my minor compulsion, right? So I like to cross first the battery all the time. Because in that case, uh, at the beginning of the equation, there will be nice EMF. It's, this EMF is usually tall, right? So it's sort of like a nice, uh, for me, just the equation look nice when there is an EMF in front. Like, <clears throat> it's not a crime, right? It's not, you can start from any point. You can start from this point, from that point, from this point, from any point you want. Equations will be still the same, just order of terms are going to be different, but who cares if you uh, add 5 plus 2 or 2 plus 5, it doesn't matter, right? So basically, basically that's the difference, right? So, but anyway, I will start from this point and you see travel direction that way, so I need to move this way, right? So, if I start from this point, so first I have to cross the uh, battery and, uh, we, and you see I'm crossing from minus to plus, right? So recall those four mnemonic rules. Rule number one, which we introduced for the battery. If you travel the battery from minus to plus, the contribution to the loop equation is positive. So delta V across the battery is plus EMF one. <coughs> so I will write even explicitly, so plus EMF one, right? You remember rule number one. You need to remember those rules. And actually, once you solve a couple of problems, applying them, it's reasonably easy to remember. Right? Or if you forgot, you can easily analyze like we've done uh, on, the, on the slide. On slides, two slides. So now we cross this battery. So next uh, on our way is this resistor, R1, right? So uh, you remember, whenever you analyze a resistor, you need to look at both directions. Current, you see current direction is down and travel direction also down. So both directions are down. That's what? It's a rule number three. The first rule about the resistor. If directions travel and current directions are the same, so the contribution is negative, all right? Minus I times R, in this case, current I1, resistor R1. So as a result, it means I can write so minus I1, R1. You know what, let me uh, warn you about one thing, because I've seen in the past even some uh, good students uh, got confused. When you analyze a battery, you need to know only the travel direction. We don't need uh, information about the current direction. But when, once, when, when you analyze uh, a resistor, you need to know both directions, current and travel. Right? But for a battery, only the travel direction. You only need to know which point is final and which point is initial in order to come up with a conclusion about the uh, contribution from the battery. Right? So minus I1, R1. Okay, guys, if something uh, confusing, tell me. Right? So now after this, we're going up through this resistor. So now this resistor in our way and uh, you see, uh, current direction is up, travel direction, we're still in the loop one, travel direction is also up. So both directions are up. So again, rule number three, if both directions are the same, so the contribution must be negative. And you know what? I will write like this, minus I without subscript and R without subscript. Which subscripts must be used? At this point, be careful here. Uh, more students, significantly larger number of students making these mistakes, which is, again, not necessary. The reason is this. When students here in this loop, for example, th there can be more than one resistor. And students develop a habit of writing every time current I1, 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 everyone. And when they get to this resistor, they still keep writing I1. But now it's a current I2 flows through this, goes through this resistor. 
so now current i2 must be used so guys be careful because i see i see almost every semester some students make this uh, mistake so here there must be i2 because now through the resistor r2 current i2 flows and the yeah, resistor is r2 right be careful at this point all right, and after that, we're back to the initial point. So we completed the loop. So uh, as a result, it means that it must be equal to zero. So now another place for mistakes. I don't know, um, probably like 60 or 70% of students, they do this when, you, when they write this loop equations. They write a bunch of these terms, but they do not complete equation. The, it must be equal to zero. So they just write usually a bunch of these terms without completing the equation. For me, it looks like I know, beheaded the equation, right? So this is the head and then that's the, the body, right? It looks really creepy right? <laughs> when uh, students write like that, right? So I keep warning, reminding, right? <laughs> so it must be an equation. If you don't write it is equal to zero, it's a mistake. It's a mistake, all right? Come on, we, we're not a we, we're science major. We're not philosophy major right or political science right it's where it's just blah 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 right uh, no here it's everything must be precise everything must be accurate right so every symbol has a meaning right so and if it's an equation it must be equal to zero then you must write it it, it is equal to zero okay so anyway so Equation number two, tada, right? So finally we can write equation number two, but again, it's not enough. We need three equations, right? And we have the loop number two. So now let's uh, play with that loop. So now loop two. Uh, again, you can start from any point. It doesn't matter, again, as I told you, if for example, let's say if you started from this point, uh, then your first term will be this, then this will be the second term, and this term would be the last one. But again, moving terms around in the equation is not going to change the equation. They will look different, but... Yeah. The looks is not important in this case. All right, so now, uh, loop number two. Again, you remember my minor compulsion. I like to cross the battery first. And as a result, it means I will start from, uh, for example, from this point. So we travel this way, right, counterclockwise. So as a result, I will cross that battery first. Because again, I like when EMF is in front. And it's like a leader. All right, so now, so if I start from here, I'm crossing this battery. So this is plus this minus, so we're crossing the battery from minus to plus. Rule number one, mnemonic rule number one. In this case, contribution must be, is positive, is positive. Plus EMF2, plus EMF2, All right? So now we, cross, we pass that battery. Now we're going down across this resistor. Okay, so now let's see. Travel direction, down, you see this green, down, but current is up. You see? So we have uh, oh, two opposite directions. Travel, oh no, current is up, travel is down. Opposite directions. Rule number four, which is about the resistor when uh, directions are uh, opposite. So it means that contribution is positive. So it's a plus. And again, current I2 times R2. So that's contribution to the loop equation which comes from this resistor. Now after this we're going here and that's our next element which we need to pass. So R3 current I3 is up, travel direction also up. So both directions are up the same. So it means that rule number three about the resistor. So in that case contribution is negative minus uh, now current I3 i3 times r3 so, so keep track of uh current current subscript uh directions are the same so negative so it's a minus i3 times r sub 3 and we're back to the starting point so it means that we need to uh complete the equation we need to my we need to write 
it is equal to zero. So that's equation number three. So what we have three unknowns, three equations, physics is over. We basically, we applied all physical concepts, all physical ideas. So now it's just algebra. Usually, usually at this point, I don't ask, oh, it's already over, class over, right? So let me uh, write this. Let me hold you for a few seconds, for a few minutes, two minutes. All right, three equations. Wait, three equations. Ah, yeah, plus three unknowns. Wait, again. All right, so physics is over. So the rest is algebra. Right. Um, <clears throat> something I want to to to. Ah, yeah. Uh, usually I don't ask students to solve the system because usually resistances are given, EMFs are given. So pretty much it will be a bunch of bunch of numbers with three unknowns, I1, I2 and I3. And uh, I stopped asking students to solve this because, yeah, if you uh, sort of apply brute force and uh, solve it manually, right, uh, by expressing one variable substituting in another, in another equation sort of it might take like 15 20 minutes and still you can make some silly mistakes it's kind of tedious right but also a student showed me that you can easily enter coefficients in your calculator and it will give you answers immediately so after that point i stopped asking students to solve this equation this system of three equations with three unknowns right so pretty much every time i usually ask to write these equations all right uh, then, um, ah, yeah, and uh, usually I, t I told you, right, so it's up to you which directions you can pick, travel directions, current directions, you have a complete freedom to pick any directions, but <clears throat> on the exam, on the test, I take that freedom away from you. Why? I usually give all these directions on the picture. Why? Because I remember what a few years ago, uh, when I was when I started teaching this course, uh, I I just give a picture of a circuit right without any directions. Uh, students solve the exam right, solve this problem. We collected uh, my TA, okay, teaching assistant right, graduate student who helped who helped me. He grabbed the exam papers, went to his cubicle in half an hour, and he, I assigned him to grade this problem right. I was grading different problems. After half an hour, he came to he came back to my office, right, with with all those exam papers, and, and he said to me, "Kill me." You know why? Because can you realize every student picked different, uh, completely different directions, travel directions, uh, car and directions, right? It's all and. That student, my TA, had to sit carefully and analyze. So these directions are here the same. Their directions are opposite. Right? So here contribution positive, negative. And you have to grade like three or four hundred students carefully analyzing like this. It's a really, really painful. I realized <coughs> how stupid uh, I was uh, by um, giving, you for, giving you that freedom uh, to pick any directions because yeah, that student, my TA struggled, right? Of course, once I finished grading my problem, I, I helped him to grade that problem because that, was, uh, that wasn't that was smart from my side. <clears throat> so from now on, I usually give all directions so that we can uh, grade um, this problem much faster. Because again, we can still uh, check your ability to apply everything, right? But... <laughs> Okay, you got the point, right? Okay, so pretty much <clears throat> this is the problem. And again, as I told you, uh, if you apply this rule, loop rule, uh, for the external loop, <clears throat> you will get an equation which is effectively equals to, if you add equation 2 and equation 3, you will get the equation for the external loop. It means that what? It means that that equation for the external loop doesn't give us any additional information. 
it means that it's linear, linearly dependent and uh, no additional information, so that equation can be dumped. And plus, you see, we don't need it. We have three equations for three unknowns. We're all set. So then, then, as I said, so if you solve these equations and you answer, for example, let's say you solve for I1, and let's say I1 happens to be 5 amps, you, uh, you answer. It means that what? Since it's a plus 5 amps, it means that this current direction uh, for I1 was correct. Our assumption was correct. But let's assume that you solve for I2 and your answer happens to be minus 3 amps. What does it mean? It means that your current, this current I2, has a value of 3 amps, but minus indicates that our assumption about current direction was wrong, so actual direction to the current is down. Direction of the current is down, right? So pretty much at the end, if you, when you solve for uh, currents, you can make a small adjustment. You can make some statements about current directions. So that's how uh, you apply Kirchhoff's